can make an important contribution in fact, to these kinds of questions. So, for example, moral questions very often have a dimension to them which science can you know, give us some insight into. So, for example, if you believe that women ought not to have the vote because they're a bit dim, then we can just do some IQ tests and so on to establish, you know, scientifically that that claim is untrue because the conclusion is based really on two ideas. One is a, a moral idea, a moral principle that you all want to give the vote to dim people, perhaps. And then the other is the, the empirical claim that uh, women are a bit dim. <clears throat> so, you can see now that science has a role to play when it comes to... I'll give you an uh, example where science cannot tread in well, this connection. It, what we've got there is an, ar is, is an argument to a conclusion, maybe not to have the vote, which combines two premises, one of which is uh, an is claim, women are dim, false. And then the other one is an ought claim, we ought not, we ought not to give the vote uh, to people who are a bit dim. Now, that ought claim, now... Well, that now be a how is it? Well, yes, no, but what, but what will happen again is that it may turn out that that claim itself, then, is a conclusion of a further argument which, which then breaks that... So up. where does the science stop? Well, you can see that uh, if, if, if Hume is right, eventually you're going to come up against your basic ought principles. <coughs> And science but is not going to see it. Well, no, that just appears to be a, a conceptual truth that you cannot get logically an ought out of an is. But I don't see that. I mean, uh, I, I don't see why, looking at our evolutionary history, looking at our social history, our ethological history, mm -hmm. our anthropological history, we cannot see how the concept of right versus wrong, might emerge. Absolutely, no, and I can see that in, in my talk. I said science can probably explain that. Yeah. But that that's all you need to distinguish is from all there. Yeah. No, that, that, is, <laughs> that isn't what you need to distinguish is from all. I mean, to, to be able to give a, a story about why we hold the moral positions that we do, and have moral intuitions that we do, is one thing. To explain why they're actually correct, morally correct, is quite a different... Well, you've got to say what you mean by morally correct. I mean, it's... Well, that we you mean accept to do that. that. <laughs> and that, <laughs> no, and that so yeah. societies thrive and survive <coughs> because they have adopted these particular codes. That's all. There's, no, there's nothing deeper than that. It's survival, ultimately. Right, so m morality is just a matter of survival. Yeah. And yeah. the right thing to do is just whatever allows us to survive... Yeah, well, within the complex of a society. I mean, look, I have some sympathy with you. That um, we, we ought to be very... I mean, human flourishing is important. Um, and we ought to be looking at human flourishing and what allows and people to flourish and enables that. That's very important when it comes to morality. And we should not take the <coughs> of that ball, as, as often happens particularly when we start thinking about something up there instead. Yeah. We, could um, be, we could be hard. But, yeah, okay. well, <coughs> but um, there is this basic problem about how you get an ought out of an is. And so here, here, I mean, here's an illustration. <coughs> Suppose that you just come up against um, what, what appears to be a nutcase. Um, they say, I'm going out tonight and I'm going to stab a few people. Uh, it's going to be great. And not only that, you know, I ought to do it. Now, um, you might say that, really? <laughs> um, you're going to go out and you're going to start to, and this is something you ought to do. I mean, this is going to cause, you know, pain and suffering. And they say, oh yeah, no, I know that, the is facts. Yeah, yeah, we're in complete agreement about the is facts. This is just something I, I, would, I ought to do. This is in my bones, I just feel this is something... That, that I ought to do. And you can say, but well, this is going to make people miserable and unhappy and it's going to cause, you know, untold suffering. They say, yeah, no, the is facts, yeah. I'm in complete agreement about the is facts. This is just something I feel I ought to do. But in this and, case, what you have to do is to analyse the psychology of the, of the nut case. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should do that. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely should do that. But, actually, in terms of, I mean, you know, in, in terms of explaining why they are mistaken 
in drawing, in, in holding the ought position they do, the fact is that the is facts are neutral. Yeah. Well, QED. The <laughs> <laughs> collection of is facts will ultimately lead to a recognition of an ought decision, in my view. What will lead to is a queen <clears throat> claim about what will happen. That's right. And that's not the question that I'm considering. I'm considering the question, but is it actually right or wrong? Not, will he think it's right? Well, it depends what you mean by right or wrong. It's what we, society or individuals, have been brought up to believe is right or wrong. It's right or wrong is only what we... Yeah. It's just what we believe is right or wrong. Isn't yeah. it well, wrong? no, what we have been led to accept is right or wrong. So if you're accepting something else, that would be right instead? Yeah, the societies might not survive if they actually adopted those alternatives. But there's no fact of the matter, which is what is wrong. Yeah. Anyway, let's move away from this. Well, <laughs> no, let's not. <laughs> <laughs> I think we ought. that goes back forever, yeah. there's still stuff in terms of science explaining everything. Yeah. Unless, unless you just suppose, you just allow for the science to be able to... No, it, it might be the laws of nature come into existence when the universe comes into existence. I mean, right. the, the universe doesn't come into existence because of, because of a pre-existing law of nature. It is, if you like, a, a, a consequence of quantum theory that the universe comes into existence because you know, quantum events don't yet exist. So there must be um, a, a, a theory of the inception of the universe which, from which Based laws on of nature theory. emerge at the same time as the entities that they control emerge. Oh, well, look, well, this is where my, my, my scientific ignorance will quickly demonstrate itself. Yeah. But look, uh, so you're saying that the universe will come into existence and, and the particular laws that we have because of certain... No, I'm saying exactly not that. Oh. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that you cannot, cannot presume that there is a pre-existing state in which there are laws which, when they operate, bring into existence this universe. So when the universe, before the universe existed, there was absolutely nothing, which includes no laws. But right. when the universe came into existence, the laws, which are really just commentaries on our behaviour, on the behaviour of the inhabitants of the universe, uh, must also come into existence. Well, so why did they come into existence? Well, that's another question. No one knows. That was my question. Yeah. yeah. You know, the no. one I said, science will go to ask. Uh, not why. Uh, it's a wrong question. You can't ask <laughs> why it came into existence. You should ask why. Why, why can't I answer? <laughs> <laughs> why can't I? Because, because I have an answer, but that doesn't mean Because it presupposes purpose. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. <laughs> I, I'm not banging the question here at all. I, no, personally, why personally I, rather, I rather doubt yeah. that, uh, that, that there's any purpose to it. So, so you can't ask uh, why it came into existence. You can ask how it came into existence. You should always, I think in science, you should always dismantle all why questions. You should always deconstruct them into how questions. Right. So how did it come into existence? Exactly, that's the question you should ask. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's, it's the sort of question that science should, it should, it should, it should ask. It should, it should always... There was absolute nothing. So what, what, you haven't got much to work with. I mean, in terms of... Uh, no, but you see how science is moving back towards accounting for nothing becoming apparently something. For example... I mean, you as a philosopher would gaze at the stars mm. and see an enormous amount of energy in the universe. And so you would be troubled about how that energy could come into existence at the inception of the universe. How could a vast amount of energy be created by whoever did it? No, I, I'm, I don't think that way. I just don't think it's a debating But that's because you're a philosopher and you're not identifying the real problems. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, what I'm doing is 
doing is I'm saying, well, why is there anything at all? Why is there something rather than nothing? <coughs> um, but that is, a, that is an but interesting... Sorry, but you've got to decide what you mean by something rather than nothing. So let yes, me just... That would be a conceptual... Let, let, uh, no, let me just work. <laughs> we can do now. And actually, my view is... Yeah. Well, look, here's the thing. I'm, I'm coming round to the view that there's something wrong with the question. And, I, and you would like this, presumably. There is actually something wrong with the question. Why is there something? I think there's nothing wrong with the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, you wouldn't let me ask it a minute ago. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with the question. Go ahead. You said I couldn't ask I was you playing words. Words. Okay, yeah. right. I, I think that there may be something wrong with the question. Why is there something other than nothing? Um, there, there's a lot of interesting philosophy on this topic. And um, I know I don't know which bits to mention because it could get quite involved. <laughs> um, but look, look um, I mean, it's, it's a very radical kind of nothing, isn't it? I mean, normally when you people say, "Why is there something? Why is there? Yeah, why is there something rather than? Why is there nothing rather than something in this cup or something?" Normally we're talking about empty tracts of space with nothing in them or periods of time in which nothing's going on. But this is this is this is not merely an absence of anything on the stage. Spatio temporal stage, this is an absence of any stage. You it's take the, the stage itself yeah. away and we say absolute nothing. It's the, ab um, it's the absence of. So there was no before space. the Big Bang. We, we, we tend to slight slip into this way of talking yeah. about big, the Big Bang as if there was, you know, well, why did it happen? As if there, were, there must have been, a, the clock was running and then bang, you know. But no, the clock starts. Yeah. So it's a very radical notion. And maybe too radical. I but mean, then, maybe, so maybe this is one of the things that philosophers might do. They might be able to show that the notion of nothing that we're attempting to work with there doesn't even make sense. Yeah. And if you could establish that actually that what we're doing is we're taking the, the word nothing as it has its home within the you know, spatio-temporal setting and then taking it outside of that and supposing that we can still make sense of that and we can't. And if philosophy could show that, it could show that the question why is there something rather than nothing doesn't even make sense. And if it doesn't make sense, then it doesn't need an answer. Right. Let me clarify. And that would be a bit of progress. And that would be philosophers doing that. That's philosophical progress. Let me show you a little bit.